What's up, folks? It's your MLS Week 18 Power Ranking Show. I'm Andrew Reby. This is Matt Doyle. We do this every single week. You can get the top 10 right here on YouTube, or you can listen live on Twitter Spaces at 11 a.m. Eastern every single Tuesday on my Twitter feed. You see it right there on the screen, at Andrew underscore Weeby. Let's start with a big dropper this week, Doyle. Nashville SC have sort of been the darlings of these power rankings, really staying consistent, not losing games well. You lost Inter Miami and you dropped five spots. That's the way it works, Nashville. What have you seen from them recently? What did you see from them in this game? Uh, I saw the expected. It, Nashville's schedule the first half of their season was extremely home heavy. I think they've played 11 home games already. And like in MLS, more than any other league in the world, the home road split, the home road differential is just massive. And they, they were a good team at home, or at least they played some good soccer. They, um, I think some of their attacking numbers are a little bit inflated because they were playing from behind so often. I mean, they first month of the year, everything was like, they were coming back from a, a two goal deficit. So um, they maybe look better in terms of the underlying numbers and they've actually been now they're going on the road and it's a different ball game. And we're seeing, Look, we, we, we crushed this team at the start of the year for being soft defensively. And if you go up 1-0 against Inter Miami and then you utterly collapse down the stretch and lose 2-1 when you're in the middle of a playoff, it, like, that, that, is, that is being soft defensively. There's no pressure on that cross. There, he's 1v3 in the box and he still wins the header. Like This, is, this sort of performance was always looming for Nashville and it's a it's a five alarm fire because they have the toughest schedule in the league remaining and you know because what it's all uh, on the road yeah what occurs to me is is that Gary Smith knows it yep uh, and Gary Smith said it after this match and he basically said look we are a completely different team in the way we approach the game and the way that we're the aggressors home versus away for whatever reason they don't have it away and, and I don't know what that reason is because I, I still am and have been really impressed with their roster build I think the way that they're Moving forward, at least with personnel, is really, really positive. Um, they are sort of the anecdote to what Miami has been of just utter chaos. They are consistent. They're a slow build. They've started to spend uh, a lot of money. they got still got to figure out how to get Ake Loba involved. But there's still that thing missing on the road, which doesn't make sense to me. Because this is a team that was built on structure and consistency and knowing exactly what you were going to get last year. Where has that gone? Yeah. That's what I, I can't quite understand that aspect of it. So I think it's hard to do that two years in a row. It's hard to be like, we're the scrappy little underdogs two years in a row, especially after you made a significant run in, in the playoffs. They crushed Miami in the playoffs last year. They beat Toronto and that wasn't, you know, they weren't a better team than Toronto last year, but like it wasn't a fluke. And then they went out, you know, to, did they go out to Columbus or New England? They went out to Columbus in what was a, a pretty good game. So like you it's tough to do that and then go into the following year with the mindset that, yeah, we're just going to be tough to break down and we're going to hit on the counter. Like it, it, it just hasn't translated. And that's where I think, you know, when I say this team is soft defensively, I don't mean physically, I mean, mentally, like, like just not locked in to these little moments that are, are make or break in this league, unless you just have so much talent and this team doesn't have so much talent. The other aspect of it, is this roster as good as it is in a lot of ways it's still not designed to really control the ball and control tempo they can't they can't defend with possession and if you look at the best teams in the league over the past few years i mean even the sounders at times and we know that brian schmetzer does not really care about possession but even the sounders will defend a lead by possessing the ball from time to time. Nashville just doesn't really have that. Now, I still think they're probably a playoff team, um, but they're, you know, they're going to have to scrap for it, man. They're, they're fifth in the in the Eastern Conference. Um, you, you can see the, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see the minus five uh, with the red arrow pointing down. That's not um, what you want. <laughs> no, it's not what you want, but it feels appropriate for this team because they really do have some stuff to figure out with the toughest part of their schedule coming up. Uh, what changes with Walker Zimmerman back, and how would you set this team up long term? We've had this debate a ton on this very show, and I've got a bunch of different opinions. But you don't spin them out. They did on Ake Loba to not play Ake Loba, but CJ Sapong has been pretty productive. How does this all sort of shake out for you 
down the stretch? And do things change with that mental softness you're talking about with Walker in the lineup? Yeah, I mean, it's hopefully, you know, Walker Zimmerman has, has been so good for this team. Hopefully he comes in and, you know, he'll be part of a, a positive change in terms of the ability to focus for 90 minutes. But he was on the field back in April and May when this team was given up two goals in the first 15 minutes of every game. So it's not like he was immune. Um, as for the setup, I do think that 3-5-2 has mostly been working. The issue with that, as you pointed out, Weeby, is like suddenly you have you know, six guys for two spots because Ani Mukhtar, he's not a midfielder. He's been very, very good as a second forward. And so now you have him and Ake Loba and CJ Sapong and Yonder Cadiz, Daniel Rios. If he ever gets back to what he was last year, like that's a lot. Um, and it's good to have depth, uh, but it, it puts a lot of pressure on, on Gary Smith to find some solutions within it. Uh, nil, nil with the Revs last week and then losing to Inter Miami at Inter Miami got a good uh, or good they have a a important stretch of two games coming up Saturday I believe uh, New England visits and then they're home again a couple days later against Orlando City and then as we've talked about over and over and over it gets really away heavy these are two really really big matches for Nashville try to pick up some points and put themselves in a better position going forward they're a 10 but they've dropped five spots let's go to number nine now that is the Philadelphia Union. Matt, Ralph, unmute yourself, man, of the brotherly game. What's up? How you feeling? It's CCL week. Uh, tell me what you are thinking about with this team as Jim Curtin prepares. I mean, and how can you not be thinking about the league? We're about to see Pax and Aronson go <laughs> off. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, we, we don't ever stop thinking about Paxton Aronson. Um, you know, <laughs> I haven't stopped thinking about him this first time I saw him play when he was like 10 playing with 14 year olds. So, uh, but no, I mean, I think, you know, obviously such a big moment for this club to to travel to Mexico City to to, to visit Azteca. Um, it's just exciting, you know, for Philadelphia Union fans to be, uh, be you know, in the, in the conversation with, you know, a team like Club America. Several fans are, you know, I'm seeing on Twitter, several fans have arrived down there and I'm a little jealous not to be down there. But, uh, you know, obviously the altitude is going to be a big factor with that. And just, you know, um, you know, but I've, I said this on a podcast last night, you know, the union, uh, no one really expects them to win. And that's actually a good place for them to be right now. Matt, one of the things that worked so well back in the spring and in, in CCL with this team um, was the productivity of, of Casper Shabilko and Sergio Santos. They, they were both, I think, fantastic in the first couple of uh, rounds of, of the CCL. They have been less fantastic, I will say, uh, during the regular season. Very hit and miss from both of them. Obviously, Corey Burke has been in and out of the lineup as well. Is, is that where the issue is? For this and we'll get to Jamiro Montero in a moment, I'm sure. But like, is this team's ceiling right now defined by which version of those forwards shows up? I mean, yes and no. I think you know you saw Sergio obviously have a great game, uh, maybe one of his maybe his second best game. Uh, his first best game was against Toronto last year with the Union. Uh, but I, I do think you know they they found other ways to score and. You know, their, their set piece, I mean, you saw uh, Glessness. I mean, Glessness has been such a weapon for them. So I do think they can score without those guys, but but they are so important. I mean, Sergio, you know, not just offensively, but defensively, you know, one of the things they did so well against Toronto was their press. And, and that's been a while since you've really seen the press be that active, be that, you know, difficult for other teams. And so, you know, obviously Sergio is a big part of that. But then also Daniel Gazdag really kind of coming into form, I think, you know, while he kind of is more of a 10 in that in that setup, he does create so much, uh, you know, again, with a disruptive play, with the movement that, that he can really kind of um, help some, kind of relieve some of that pressure on Casper and on Sergio. And I wouldn't judge last game too much with that formation where Sergio is kind of left on an island. I, I do think the combination of Sergio and Casper or Corey Burke when he comes in, I mean, you saw that kind of. Jim used both Corey and Sergio to kind of wear teams out against Atlanta that worked so well. Um, I, I do think that's that that that's such an important key. And, and you know, Casper is he's 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 in form in this competition, and this might be just what he needs to kind of get back. Uh, you know, to kind of have a you know sort of refocus his attention on on, on CCL and 
obviously he his size and his presence on set pieces both offensively and defensively has, has been really important as well so uh, you know it's it's definitely a point of concern but I also think with Gazdag again coming into the form that he's coming in and um, you know I think they can they, they can open things up a, a little bit in, the, in this uh, you know they, they get, they'll have their moments for sure on Thursday 10 p.m. Eastern uh, Estadio Azteca Cuba America, Philadelphia Union, you're our last hope, Union. Please, please. It's the semifinal, the first leg, FS1, Univision, 2DN. It is the fifth game between Liga Max and MLS uh, opponents this week. It will be the capper. Of course, League's Cup is here. You know I'm a huge League's Cup guy. We'll get to that in a little bit as well. Uh, you kind of mentioned, though, Matt, these expectations, and you tamped them down a little bit. What, what, are, what, what would be a success for the Union in this, apart from the blindingly obvious, which is to get through and go to a final? What if they can't do that? What would be good enough in your mind and in the club's mind? I mean, I really think for them to return to Chester in September with a chance, you know, so to limit the, to limit, you know, if they can limit uh, Club America to one nil, or if they can, you know, pull out of an away goal and lose two one, I think they're in great position. I, I just think the success, they're not going to be defined by you know winning CCL. If they do that, it'll be amazing, and 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 I think. You know, Jim has said, you know, he's challenged his players just to, to dream it, you know, to dream big, to to not really listen to, to us saying they don't have a chance and to really just go for it. And so I think for them to come back in September to Chester with a crowd that's going to be very mixed, a lot of Club America fans will be there and to have a, to have a fighting chance, I think would be would be huge. And I think it will will, will, will really would really carry this team through uh, to a potential successful MLS Cup run as well. What's up with Jamiro Montero, man? You know, I saw him. Uh, I saw him hanging out with some kids uh, in, in in the city the other day. Uh, you know, he, he he's in transfer talk. So at this point, it it doesn't seem like he will be coming back to the team. But uh, you know, I don't have any other insight beyond that. Just that that he's not part of the team right now. He's not been training with them. And you know, it's 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 a it's a weird situation. Somewhat rem- reminiscent, if you remember, of Vincent Nagiro when he left the club, and you know, it was just really kind of a. A difficult and disappointing thing because he was such a good player for this team, and uh, you know certainly Gazdag heating up. Maybe maybe some fans aren't thinking about that, that as much, but he was such an important player to this team, and it's it's really sad to see that it's it's very possible that he he will he has played his last game for the Union. All right, give us the packs and errands and uh, hype train stuff, and that will let you go, Matt. Because that goal and your first start, what is it mm-hmm. in the water? But in, in this Aaron's and household. Like there's just something there. Yeah, Medford, New Jersey. I know it's it's near the Pine Barrens, and uh, you know I, you know I, I think they have a great family. Their dad has uh, been so involved in their their both of their development. You know he also coaches their little sister as well, and you know I think they've they've really uh, both of them have really just exploded since COVID. You know in terms of they spent a lot of time training together, and I th- I think they just really feed off each other, and I think Paxton has kind of kind of waited his turn and, um, you know, been patient and, and, and done the work. Like you see him just like Brendan, kind of the last one to leave training all the time. And, you know, he's, he's sort of built for this and, you know, nothing seems to really phase him just like Brendan goes into, you know, <laughs> Mercedes Benz and no big deal. 18 scores a goal against uh, Brad Guzan. Something about Aronson's, you know, their first starts and scoring against USMNT goalkeepers. I mean, it's just the bigger the stage, the, the more, uh, the more they're fueled to, 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 to succeed. Paxton don't care about your expected goals differential, Matt Turner. He's got that left foot. I see, uh, I see Andrew Farrell in here. And Andrew, thank you for listening to this show. I see you all the time in here. Uh, congratulations on 255, man. We'll talk revs in just a little bit as well because they're number one on this one. But uh, he had a nice view of that move from Paxton Aronson. <laughs> uh, last one for you, Matt, then I'll let you go. I always have one more. I'm just curious about this because we're sitting here talking union. It's a disappointment, really, based on last year that they're ninth in these power rankings. They're starting to find themselves again, is what Jim Curtin says. They're in a semifinal in CCL. It just occurs to me, having covered this team from the very beginning, that this is like you know, this is like Shangri-La for for union fans from those first five or so years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And like I said, to to have this to be in this place is something that fans have dreamed about. You know, unfortunately for them to make CCL in a COVID year, you know, fans didn't get to go to Costa Rica. I was, you know, planning to go to Costa Rica if they ever got to play there and, you know, it didn't work out. So, you know, aside from that, it's just it really is a great time to be a union fan. And also just because, again, you you, you, you just know this team is going to going to put everything out there. And 
even if they aren't successful, the fact that they're on this stage compared to, you know, the goalkeeper uh, stories and the, you know, just some of the things that this were coming out of this club, you know, coffin, uh, you know, coming into the stadium and uh, oh, for yeah, the, the supporters, con- it's, it's just, it's, they've come <laughs> a long way as a team and it's exciting. It's exciting to see young players like Paxson and Jack McGlynn and Quinn Sullivan, you know, kind of getting minutes and, you know, holding their own against, you know, a team like New England. And, you know, it's, it's just, a, it's a great time to be a union fan. And it's great to have, people talking about the union because frankly uh you know there were a lot of years where people kind of laughed about the union but they didn't really talk seriously about them no laughing anymore hopefully uh union aren't taken out of Aztec on a coffin on thursday night number nine in the power rankings didn't move a bit philadelphia union matt thanks for joining us man it's been great to chat yeah thanks for having me yeah no problem all right pablo i sent you the invite man unmute yourself we're on to number eight dc united up six spots, Doyle. <laughs> Let's go. The black and red. Andy Nahar. Big win against Montreal. You know, Pablo, I hear that background here. I can't tell if that's, if you're, you know, that sounds like power tools, man. I don't know where you're at. No? Now you no. can hear me, right? Yeah, we're good now, man. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I want to express my deep concern at you describing yourself as a, quote, League's Cup guy. Uh, <laughs> I don't really know what that means. Uh, I, I'm not sure what it means either, Pablo. But I know I am one, and uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna own this because I feel like it's a long play. In like 20 years, when everybody loves the League's Cup and it looks completely different, and it's been a part of our soccer calendar long term. I will have been an early adopter, and oh, I'm man, okay people, with that. People are saying that about the entire league in 1996, and it's still not true. A- anyways, <laughs> anyways, Matt uh, also got me thinking about some story ideas, talking about uh, disgraceful or you know like. Uh, not disgraceful, but, um, you know, troubling departures from the union. And I really think I need to do the Rise Maboli uh, oral <laughs> history at some point, but, but I don't know. Uh, there's some, I mean, I think you could go back a little deeper there. Go talk to Moby Akugo about some early days and see what you pull out of that. Hey, but it's good times in D.C. right now. On YouTube, we're just watching this Andy Nahar goal. I mean, that got me emotional, honestly. Yeah, man, Andy, uh, yeah, it, it, it's like... I guess there was some question about whether they would even sign him. Obviously, Andy sort of bounced around, had a history of injuries, um, didn't feature particularly well for LAFC, and has just been um, kind of a transformational player this year. I mean, he, he, he he's almost sort of the player that DC might have thought they were getting. And Ed- Edison Flores, obviously not the same player positionally, but uh, Andy is the guy who's running at defenders, who's making defenders look stupid with some regularity, you know, so it's been, um, it's been sort of a blessing to, to get to watch him again. Obviously a feel good story. He's, he's uh, as DC United as they come, you know, so. One of the original uh, homegrown players. Yeah. And obviously we have homegrown players. Uh, I think, I think Pablo is driving. I, 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 uh, yeah. Which vehicle are we in right now, Pablo? Uh, I'm just outside. Oh, all right. Uh, am I but, am I tough to hear? No, you're no, good. You're okay now. Um, so obviously the homegrown players, Kevin Paredes and and Moses and Nyman in particular, are are, are taking a big step forward this year. Uh, but it's also like Julian Gressel playing like the player that they thought they were getting last year when they acquired him. Ola Kamara is uh, on an absolutely torrid pace, and like all on down the list. Felipe, Junior Moreno, Russell Canals before he got hurt. Um, when that many players are playing well individually and sort of collectively taking a step forward, it, it has to point to the coach. Um, what has Hernan Lasada done right? Is it tactical? Is it, is it physical? Is it mental? Like, I mean, we know that physically at the start of the year, he was all over this team for what he perceived as a lack of fitness. Is that what we have um yeah, is that the issue that he solved? Yeah, guys, I think we may be having some technical difficulties because I barely heard anything of what you said. <laughs> Hernan Lozada, the job he's done, man. Yeah, do I mean, obviously, I think it's, um, you know, it's 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 interesting for DC United fans. Obviously, they've been very used to one thing for the past 10 years. Um, Lozada has done a lot with a little. Obviously, I don't think, you know, there's been nothing uh, revolutionary about the style of play. Obviously, he just presses. Uh and, you know, obviously it's a high energy, um, sort of attack is really stress fitness and whatnot. I mean, this is nothing particularly new in MLS, but, um, but compared to what, uh, what DC fans have been watching, obviously for the past 10 years or a good bulk of that, it's been, um, 
it's been a breath of fresh air, obviously. And certainly, um, he's saying all the right things. I often think that it doesn't take much an MLS to inspire a fan base. I mean, you sort of have to joke that like every coach comes in and says, we want to play on the front foot. We want to play high energy, blah, 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 entertaining soccer. But he has done that to some extent, which, like I said, people just aren't used to here. So, so certainly, yeah, um, it's been a breath of fresh air. What's the, help me with the relationship with the players, because I think we were sort of postulating at the beginning based on some of the things that were coming out that maybe, maybe it might be a little rough. And we saw that with Heinze, like Heinze did not connect with enough of his squad or the club to keep his job. Well, Hernan Lasada came in, did a lot of the same things, at least from a physical uh, load standpoint, and obviously was very strict about diet as well. But probably the biggest image that stands out to me of that win this weekend is final whistle, Hernan Losada, Paul Areola, Andy Nahar, Kevin Predes, all these guys from like kind of different generations in a way, coming together and hugging, having a group hug on the sideline. He's used 28 guys. It feels like this squad is fully bought in. Is that what's going on? Uh, I, I don't know that I would take it that far. I think there's oh, like, you know, I think there's um, sort of a, you know, there would have, let's just say there was probably a genuine possibility earlier in the year that this would have turned out not quite as catastrophic as Heinstein's run at Atlanta, but, but something like that, right? I mean, all it takes is two, three, four losses in a row, and that belief and that sort of stuff, which is still in its infancy, would have gone out the door, right? I mean, certainly DC as a club kind of institutionally is a team and an organization that's been doing things one way for a long time, and, and um, you know, Hernan has ruffled some feathers in the front office. He's ruffled some feathers with players at first you know particularly veteran guys who are used to doing things one way they had trouble adjusting you know with some of the staff etc you know some of the training staff had you know it has had a huge sort of uh has had difficulty adjusting to sort of his demands on players um but the bottom line man is if you're winning games and dc now is you know above the playoff line and you know just to obviously like is trending upwards um that goes a long way. It doesn't, you know, those things are a lot harder to pay attention to when you're winning games, you know? So, um, and yeah, you know, are non more personable with players than Heinze, more personable with the press than Heinze. I mean, there are definitely differences there, obviously, uh, that work in his favor, you know? From this point on, what would be a success for DC United? Like what's their benchmark end of the year? If they do X, that will have been a successful season. Are we already there? Yeah, I mean, look, I I loathe to say this because it's the it's the stock answer, but the season unquestionably is a success if they make the playoffs. Given the fact that they've they've really not just this year, but even part of last year, have been completely decimated by injuries. I mean, the number of key contributors they've been missing is pretty insane. You know, Losada obviously hasn't really had a chance to put a stamp on the team transfer wise, right? So he's working with. Uh, tools, some of which he might not, um, you know, have full faith and belief in, right? So I, I would think, uh, you know, if you see DC make the playoffs, which by all accounts it seems like they'll probably do, although <clears throat> I won't catch, you know, count those eggs before they hatch. Uh, you got to consider that a, a success, man. I mean, even even Lasada, I think, you know, when he got hired, he really tempered the expectations and said, "Look, this is going to take time," and this that, and the other thing, and um, and you're already sort of seeing a stamp on the team, and and you're already seeing the results probably that DC envisioned when they hired him. So, um, you know, I, I guess probably just making the playoffs. Again, I really hate saying that because that's also every MLS coach's answer. But, you know, whatever. DC going to Nashville this weekend. And we'll have an ESPN Plus. That's on Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern. I think I got that time wrong last time. Pablo, appreciate your time, man. Uh, we are going to keep this thing moving right now. DC United, big jumpers, the biggest jumpers, up six spots to eight. Orlando City drops two spots to seven, Doyle. They've got League's Cup this week. Mm -hmm. Santos Laguna coming to Exploria Stadium, so you can tune in and see that one right before that CCL match between America and, and, uh, and Philly. It's at 7 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Plus and two day in. Where is uh, where's Orlando right now? 1-1 in Cincinnati. It's not a result that good teams love. No, but I mean, when you consider how heavily rotated the squad, it, the squad was, and um, they frankly did well to only be down one nil in the first half. And then they got that absolute gift from Alan Cruz. I, I, I think they're 
probably pretty satisfied with the point. I mean, this is what we say, right? You, you win at home and you, you draw on the road and, um, you know, they, they haven't necessarily been taking care of that win at home part recently, but you, you can't, I don't want to say you can't knock a point on the road. A, a point on the road, given the circumstances, is a, is a good thing for Orlando City. Now, where I'm at on them is middle of last year during MLS's back, I guess so technically kind of the beginning of last year, they were so good. And like using the ball to pull teams apart, getting both fullbacks forward, you know, finding pockets of space for Nani or Chris Mueller or uh, Mauricio Pereira. And other than Nani, none of that is sort of clicking in the same way in, in 2021. And all like I'm just waiting for it all to round into shape and to start looking like it did last July again. And at some point, you, you stop waiting for that and you start saying, well, actually the, the team that we're seeing week after week is the actual version of this team. Um, and, and this, it's, it's still good, right? They, they still deserve their place in the top 10. Um, they're, you know, I think fourth in the, in the playoff race in the Eastern conference, maybe third in the Eastern conference. Like that's all fine. I, I don't think it's bad at any point, but I, I think, the honest Orlando city fans will tell you that there's a difference between the team that we're seeing so far this year and the team that was literally competing for a trophy in the final a year ago at this time. What do you think is different? Like what's missing? So it it started last year with the injuries to Jean Moutinho and Ori Russell, because those guys were, were integral to their ability to use possession and just use the ball to rip teams apart. And Moutinho has not been the same. It's been a year now since that injury. He has not been the same player at any point. Ori Russell, he, he's, you know, kind of down the list a little bit now in central midfield, though, with Sebastian Mendes out for a while, he's been getting more minutes. Those two things. And then Mauricio Pereira taking a step backwards as well. Like he's just not as effective as he was last year. Um, He's again, he's been better lately, but I don't think he's at the level that he was in 2020. So all of these individual regressions have led to a team wide regression. I think stylistically and in just in terms of ceiling, Oscar Barea has such a good coach. He can sort of roll with it. Right. And we saw him do this in Dallas for years. There were times we be, and we, We both saw this where Dallas played the best football in the league. They were so good. But then there were times where they'd be like two, three straight months. All they would do is counter. This is, this is, this. There were times where I would, in my mind, I was, I was like, this is defensive grinded out Dallas. Yep. And this is defensive grinded out Orlando City right now. Now, There are more pieces to come in. Nani will start, you expect, in League's Cup. They were saving him for that. So, League's Cup guy right here. That's why, baby. I mean, Uh, Daryl DK DK wasn't on the bench uh, for this game either. Um. Yeah, and they're gonna lose Mueller. It just sort of feels like they had something bottled last year, and maybe that's that. Like Oscar's in. There's hope. We're improving. We're playing well. And now some of that feels just a, not stagnant. It's just that the injuries and circumstances slowed them down a little bit. Yeah, and and it might. I don't want to say it closed the window. The window for this team to to win a title this year is is still very much open. Whether it's MLS Cup or, um, you know, the most prestigious tournament in the world, the League's Cup. Exactly. Um, at least in this hemisphere. I mean, yeah, maybe a little, give us some time, we'll get it to the world. But I I had hopes that Orlando City would come in, in, you know, in 2021 and just play beautiful, attractive soccer, which they did last summer. And they just, for injuries primarily and for, you know, just the grind of the regular season. They just haven't been able to put it together like that. I'm still waiting for it, but I think we need to kind of get used to the idea that this group is never going to quite hit that level again. Uh, Orlando city, by the way, not in action this weekend in MLS play. They're the team with the weekend off Seattle Sounders was that team prior. They will go to Nashville after their league's cup journey. Uh, midweek next week. They dropped two spots to seven, Orlando City. Let's keep it rolling here. Uh, we're going to LA Galaxy. Alicia, I believe I've sent you the invite. I've done it again. Unmute yourself when you can. Up two spots for a home draw with the Vancouver Whitecaps. Uh, the voters, a little interesting on that one. Maybe they're voting on additions because there have been some big ones. Maybe no bigger, or I guess certainly no bigger, than De- uh, Dejan uh, Jovlic. Jovlic. Yeah, I had that right. Jovlic. Alicia, what's up? <laughs> Another goal scorer is in camp, and he's a pure goal scorer, says Greg Vanny. 
Yeah, uh, I look forward to seeing all the pure goals being scored by him. <laughs> <laughs> Do they are they are they going to play together, or is this purely a one striker system? Uh, so we all know that uh, Vanny is uh, used to changing things up, and he's pretty flexible. I think he's probably the most successful flexible coach in MLS right now. Um, he he said straight up this week this past week that he is planning on doing a little bit of both. So. There'll be times when uh, the strikers will be rotated. There'll be times when he'll play them together. And I think it's kind of kind of be based on, um, you know, how they're feeling, if anyone's injured, if there's a heavy load of games, and also what seems to be working the best. And, um, you know, I think basically that's, that's pretty sensible overall. What is working the best yeah. right now? Well, I think right now they're actually kind of grinding things out a little bit. Um, you know, they've been shorthanded for... Uh, several weeks at this point um, with a, a, a slew of starters or, or um, you know, edge starters gone at the Gold Cup and uh, Chicharito being hurt for a little while. Um, so they've been kind of grinding lately, but because they have so many player new players, uh, that's given them an opportunity to kind of see what they can do and, and give them a chance to play. Um, I think, you know, for the most part, most of the squad is is playing right now and of the few who aren't, most of them are playing uh, with low dose. So we're seeing a lot of guys getting uh, minutes right now. Um, but as we move into kind of the dog days and get ready for the playoff push, I think it's it's going to be a matter of seeing um, the the A team come together, whatever that happens to end up being, <laughs> and seeing if they can actually really push on and um, click, uh, you know, down the home stretch of the season. How's Chicharito doing? Like, when when does he come back here? Yeah, it's it's a little bit of a mystery, and uh, I've been kind of waiting to see what um, what's going to be happening because I'm getting I, I wouldn't necessarily say concerned, but um, a little bit intrigued by the extended absence. And um, you know, Vanny said that they were going to take it slow with him and and make sure that they got him fully healthy and strong so that uh, there wouldn't be any recurrence of of the calf injury he suffered. But seems like it's been quite a while. I need to go back and look and see how many games he's actually missed here. Um, and I'm curious to see what the, his status will be for this weekend, because if it's another game out, it's sort of like, okay, is there, you know, did he have a, a setback or is, is it something worse or was it just the, a calf injury? And we all know that those can be really, really finicky. Um, you know, did, did something happen or is it kind of the normal course and we just have to wait and see what happens. So throughout the season, for the most part, it's been a four, two, three, one, um, and, and I think Greg Vanny really wanted to play a 4 2 3 1 uh, for the last couple of years with Toronto. He just didn't have uh, the personnel for that. Maybe a little bit more of a 4 3 3. Regardless, one center forward. And now he, he, let's presume that Chicharito does come back soon and that we have the new addition um, coming to Carson. Uh, we, how, like, is it just an open competition to see who the starting number nine is? Or. or could this be an indication that there's going to be a 4-4-2 or a 3-5-2? Because as you mentioned at the top, Greg Vanny's pretty flexible and he's been able to win um, using both of those formations and uh, in the past. Is there, I mean, are, can you read the tea leaves here and tell us what's, what's coming? I definitely think there's going to be some uh, games where we'll see a, a two-striker set. And I think, obviously, ideally, you want to see both of those um you know, both those guys filling those slots and seeing what their chemistry is, if they can work together. Um, Cause obviously if they can, then, you know, you're going to run with that. If it seems like it's, it's not really working. Or like I said, if one of them keeps getting hurt or is out for a long time, then, you know, you can be a little more flexible. Um, I think the good news is behind those two strikers, um, you know, moving back in the field, when you see the options on the wings in midfield, um, there's a lot of versatile options and, and a lot of guys who play different kinds of roles, you know, more attacking, more defensive. So I think there's there's a lot of good options for the Galaxy um, in midfield. So I don't necessarily think we're, we're locked in a situation where um, the roles are extremely regimented. And, you know, if, if they change the formation, then it's going to screw the whole team up. I, I think that, you know, there's there's a lot of options. And again, we we really haven't seen this team kind of have its top 11 at this point. You know, they keep adding players and there's been international absences and injuries and whatnot. Um, so I think one of the big things is to see, okay, if they say this is going to be our top 11, 
how are they going to play? You know, are, are they going to hit the ground running? Are they going to need some time to adjust? Um, again, I think the stretch that we've been through for the last month or so, the team has been fairly decent with a, a group that for the most part is not the kind of top uh, starting lineup that we would see in, in most positions uh, on the field. So, you know, I'm as curious as anyone to see kind of what they, they roll out with. But I think as far as the, the lineup, we'll probably see a four, uh, four man defense. Um, and then I think from there, we'll see either two striker sets and, or one striker set and uh, kind of the chips will fall. Otherwise, you know, depending on how Vanny rolls those out. Just want to throw out the last month of form for the Galaxy here. A loss away to the Whitecaps, a draw away to Real Salt Lake, a loss away to Dallas, and they won at home, Timbers and RSL, and then they drew at home against the Vancouver Whitecaps. So they've been missing big pieces, sort of a middle ground there for them as far as results, but still in a good spot in the Western Conference. Last one for you, Alicia, and then we'll let you go here. Who is the best offseason signing so far, or in season, because some of those have come in season, for the Galaxy? Wow. Uh, there are so many players, honestly. I mean, I think they've they've signed, what, upwards of 14 or 15 at yeah, this point? Yeah, crazy. Um, How about this? Maybe I'll simplify it for you. Cabral or Grandsire? Who's been a better signing? Um, I think Grandsire has, has kind of f- fit in a little bit better. Um, I think Cabral's struggling a little bit more. Um, and he, he mentioned the other day, after scoring his goal, that uh, he's kind of coming to terms with the physicality of, of MLS, which I was a little bit surprised about. Um, I'll admit, I don't watch a lot of Ligue 2, but <laughs> in Ligue 1, it, it's regarded as a pretty physical league. And so for the players coming from France to say, oh, I wasn't really prepared for the physicality of MLS, that's a little bit of a surprise. Um, I think both players are still, you know, really trying to find their best form, but I think Grancier is doing a little bit better job of if he's not scoring the goals, he's, you know, grinding to set up his teammates he's um you know looking for the next pass that kind of thing and I think so far uh you know with the understanding that his the expectations around him were a little bit lower than they were for Cabral as a young DP um I think Grancier is is settled a little bit better so far he was definitely anticipating that contact late in this match didn't come for him the galaxy goal didn't come either they're up two spots so two six uh big thanks to you Alicia SB Nation, at Soccer Musings, everything that happens in California goes straight through Alicia. So uh, make sure you give her a follow. Let's keep it rolling here. And we go to a number five, the Colorado Rapids, up two spots after a nil-nil at home. Connor Cape, uh, I, sent, I sent you the invite, man. If you uh, if you can jump in with us, that would be awesome. Uh, I'll resend it right now. Doyle, what do you think of the Rapids right now? I've kind of gone on a rant the last couple weeks that they deserve more respect for their project. And I thought this would be this big sort of like, finding out moment for both teams, but it kind of wasn't. What'd you see? Well, I mean, it wasn't only because of Tim Melia. Amelia had a, you know, player of the week level performance in, in this game. And the, the, hey, Connor, the, 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 uh, this sporting defense scrambled pretty well a bunch. And then, you know, Colorado's Achilles heels. They don't have a, a pure goal scorer who could win them games like this, but, um, I, I think we saw w- with just the level of performance against a sporting KC team that's atop the Western Conference, this is a real good team. Um, and they've been showing that this is a really good team uh, for most of the year. How's that match up with your viewpoint, Connor? I think uh, I think Matt's pretty spot on right there. I think this is a good team. And I would love to say that this team is uh, flying under the radar, but when you reach a a new high in the power rankings, I don't think you you can say that anymore. So maybe people are, are starting to take notice of the job that, that Robin has done this year. What is that in your mind? What has he done? That's uh, that's made this so successful. Uh, I think it's a lot of things. I think since he came in, he, uh, he really took over the locker room, which goes back, I think to when Connor Casey was the interim manager holding that locker room together and then handing off the reins to Robin when he came in in August of, of 2019 and taken the job, but all the guys love playing for him. Like it doesn't matter if they're a regular starter. It doesn't matter if they uh, are seeing bench minutes or rarely ever play. Everybody is willing to run through a brick wall for the guy. And I think that's just because he's, he's putting guys in, in individual positions of where they can succeed. Like he doesn't ask anybody to do something that they can't do. And he asked Keegan Rosenberry to play center back the last two games. And Keegan says, yeah, I'll do that. And Keegan believes he can do that. And then he goes out and does it. I think that has a big, uh, a big, a big, a big role to play in it. What'd you see from Mark Anthony K? That's then the big move of the deadline for them. You're getting it in prime. Uh, CONCACAF 
top level central midfield to add to a number of guys that already fit that mold in Colorado. Would you see from him? Yeah, I think we're now talking about one of the best, one of the best midfields in MLS, if not the best. And he comes on and it's kind of a weird game because sporting had, had rotated some guys. And uh, I think it was the first time in forever that sporting didn't have a shot on goal. And it was the first time since 2018 that the Rapids didn't end up with a goal at home. So it's kind of strange, kind of weird, kind of a weird one to judge. But anytime he's on the ball, he turns, gets upfield immediately, and he just glides. I think it's the long legs, but the dude just glides. And it's exciting to watch him try to set up a pass for, you know, hopefully down the road. It's Diego Rubio or it's Michael Barrios or somebody on the left wing like a Brian Calvon. But he had a good debut, all things considered. Kind of a, a strange game, but all things considered, a good debut. So, you know, setting – up player X, Y, or Z. That's the question with this team because there, there isn't a pure goal scorer in the roster. Uh, I think Robin Frazier has done an excellent job of sort of mixing and matching personnel and lineups and formation. In this one, it was more of a 3-5-2 with kind of Cole Bassett as a second forward and Michael Barrios stretching the back line. Do you see this all pointing in any particular direction in terms of formation and in terms of, of who's going to be the guy to put the ball in the back of the net. Yeah, I think uh, I think last year Colorado was going into the playoffs, had 10 or 11 different goal scorers, but there was nobody who had like 12, 14, 15 goals. So it was kind of a, everybody had two or three, basically. And I think ideally it would be back to that 4-3-3 three, three, and Diego Rubio is in the middle up top and Michael Barrios is on the right side and Barrios is serving in balls for somebody like Diego or somebody like Kellen Acosta or Cole Bassett, who's crashing the box from the midfield. Hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you. Is there a starting job for Cole Bassett in the midfield still? Because if Mark Anthony Kay is there and Jack Price and Kellen Acosta are there and you're playing a 4-3-3, somebody's got to be the odd man out. Yeah, and that is that is the question on everybody's mind is, is what are we what, what's going to happen here if everybody's healthy – Nobody's on international duty and everybody's well rested. Who is your first choice 11, Robin? And I think we don't have an answer to that quite yet. It's going to come down to who plays well in training and who, when they get the opportunity to play, who makes the most of it. And I also, I don't think Robin is afraid to change it up either. We've seen him change the formation, you know, half a dozen times this year. He's not afraid to ask guys to do different things or to, to sit down Kellen or Mark Anthony Kay for, for a match to get Cole Bassett some minutes or, bring in Cole Bassett as a sub the way we've seen him use uh, Jonathan Lewis in the past couple of years. 16 goals allowed in the West. I don't know if you just broke up there, Connor. You might've, cause you, you dropped out immediately, but 16 goals allowed in the West is second, just to Seattle. And uh, nobody's talking about this defense much. Who's been the standout performer on the back line in your opinion? Oh, standout performer on the back line. I think there's two answers. I think the first answer defensively is Austin trustee. Uh, comes over from Philadelphia last year and I think he only played like 576 minutes uh, was not a lot and just could not break into the rotation of the starting 11 at all and this year he comes in he has a great outing with uh, the US men's Na- or the youth the youth national team ahead of the Olympics and the qualifiers and then he comes back to training camp before the season starts and just continues lighting it up and he absolutely earned a spot he earned a spot and he has been the best defender all year and also I think you have to give a little love to Danny Wilson who is maybe not the greatest or most athletic defender but everything starts with Danny Wilson in the back he's the one who distributes he's the one who hits the diagonal long balls he's the one who passes forward to guys like Mark Anthony Kay or Kellen Acosta as we go forward into the second half of the season and I think he's been a little underrated in that role because it does start the attack does start with him and it only starts if you're doing your job defensively a little bit of a carryover some of those signings initially didn't work for the rapids but all of them are now five in these power rankings up two spots big thanks to you connor thanks for chatting with us man uh, we'll, we'll talk to you another time okay thanks guys appreciate it all right let's go to number four keep this uh, show rolling moving along here in new york city down two spots after a 2-2 draw in toronto doyle you've been high on new york city all year and so have the underlying numbers Yep. Uh, where are you now? Uh, same place. I, I, I think this 
team, and we saw it in the first 45 minutes. I mean, the goal, if you're watching on YouTube, the oh my God, yeah. first goal uh, from Santi Rodriguez is just absolutely wonderful. And, like, it's Rodriguez and it, and it's, uh, you know, Tiago Andrade. And, like, that's $20 million worth of South American, uh, you know, young attacking additions right there, combining on that one. And, of course, Tati Castellanos with the, the final touch. It fell apart for them in the second half. Right, like the NYCFC dominated the first half and were completely dominated in the second half in the way that they, they, they just haven't been all year long. Um, and Toronto were unlucky not to get the winner. Um, but that is that is an outlier so far for this team. Um, what what they've shown over the course of this year that they play some of the best soccer in the league. Um, whether or not you think they have a championship ceiling. Um, it complete at this point, I think it completely depends upon your opinion of, of Tati Castellanos. Um, and he, he is one of, if not the very best pressing center forwards in the league. Uh, we saw just how good of a playmaker and setup man he could be uh, in, in this game. I think he had both primary assists. Um, it, you know, he, it, he always gets into good spots to put the ball in the net he does not put the ball in the net with the regularity that you need to if if you're going to you know win an MLS Cup or win a supporter shield. Um, do you? I'll ask you. Weeby. I'm Team Tati. I'm straight up Team Tati, and I don't think it, if they don't if they don't meet their potential and they have a massive amount of it because in the starting lineup you don't have Maxi Morales who's been the talisman for so long. You don't have Tyus Magno who seems like he's going to take more time to settle than Tiago Andrade has. The amount of of firepower. I mean, Jesus Medina didn't start this game. He's yep. he's damn near on ten goals this year. The amount of firepower they have is absurd. Yep. To me, it's it's the more inconsistent side that's going to get them, and I don't think that comes down to Tati. He does so much, so many things well that, that I'm 100%, not going to. percent. No, that you don't think that comes well, what? down to Tati. What those two goals that they allowed in the second half is Tati. That, but that is an outlier. That defensive performance from NYCFC in the second half is a complete outlier for them. They have been one of the best teams in the league. The only inconsistency in this team it, it comes from not finishing the chances that they've created, and that's Tati Castellanos. He has like five goals on eleven expected goals. I want to say, and it, in like one. Of I'm looking. Like, at, I'm do you looking remember? down their game. I'm looking down their form guide right now. They have almost never been shut out this year. Yeah, like this is a team that scores. They're scoring goals in spite of that. Yeah, I don't that's know. What I'm I, saying. That, I, like, I don't think. I don't think it's on him. I just don't think it's on him. So what do you think it's on then? The inconsistencies in performances. That is not just Tati Castellanos. It's the whole team. One minute. 45 minutes, perhaps. They look like world beaters. The next 45 minutes, they can't keep up with pace of Toronto FC. But that's not on your center forward. No, this this week it was not. This week it was not. But I'm, like... team, I'm team Tati. I'm okay. team Tati. You can't sway me from this one. The man is he's special. I do wish he scored more goals because he's in the position to do so, and that would put away games. You're so, right about that. So let me ask you th this then. What is – well, first of all, do you believe this is an elite team? And if not, what is keeping them from that? It, you, is it just purely inconsistencies throughout the rest of the team? You don't believe that their defensive level is consistent enough. You don't. No, I, th I think that no. Their I, uh, midfield is consistent. This enough. is the problem. I struggle. Again. I struggle to pinpoint with them why it is they're not a little bit higher. Like, what is it? It doesn't feel like it's a consistent one thing where it's like, well, you know, Tati just lets you down in these games. Well, their center back pairings are not good enough. Well, central midfield, you know, they, they allow too much space and time on the ball. Like, I, I just feel like it's, you know, it, it's a different thing in every bad result that they have. Uh, and I struggle to pinpoint it. And that's what that's what makes me frustrated with this team. That's why I always ask you about the underlying numbers and where you're at on them, because I always expect more, and I just feel like they've been giving maybe two notches down from what they're capable of mm. all year and for a while now. And a lot of times that changes when Maxi's in the lineup, uh, but it did in the second half tonight. I don't know. I, I struggle with what to make of New York City, and I struggle to say that they are a championship contender when they just can't quite put it together for long stretches. Now, they are on a five-game unbeaten run right now. Yep. Before that, it was two away losses. Yeah, I mean, and one of those losses was Zellerion going berserk with the free kicks, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, and that was a game that, that NYCFC had dominated, just dominated. 
and they did not put the ball in the net. They, like the inconsistency was there. It was in front of goal. Let Tati live. Okay. I mean, Let I, Tati I, live. I, he's clearly like, he's clearly a good forward. But I, I like, I, I firmly believe that in order to be a championship team, your number nine has to put the ball in the back of the net with a, a high level of consistency. And to me, that is like, that is the dividing line for NYCFC this year. If, if Castellanos was performing at the, at a level commensurate with his underlying numbers or even 80% of, of that level, uh, this team is no lower than second in the power rankings and, and frankly probably they would be first in the power do you rankings. think it's that or do you think there's an element of luck here because i'm just i'm thinking about the underlying numbers i'm thinking about the teams around them new york city has more goals scored than any team but new england they've allowed fewer goals than anybody but nashville in the conference they have the the best goal differential in the whole damn conference and yet here they are below Orlando, who doesn't have that efficient forward you're talking about. Below New England, who who now do, I guess, you could say that, that Bo is that guy and Buxa has been that guy. Is there just an element of unluckiness to this? Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of smart people will tell you that good finishing is more to do with luck than skill. Uh, I don't entirely believe that, but um, you know, our good friend Elliot McKinley on, on Twitter yesterday, he you know, he posted a graphic showing, you know, four quadrants, bad and unlucky, bad and lucky, good and lucky, which is where the revs are, and good and unlucky, which is where NYCFC are. Like, they they like they have had bad luck, whether it's missing clear chances, getting penalties saved, or Zella Ryan with his in, in the gym range, banging him free kicks from, from 30 yards out. That's bad luck. I mean, it's also skill on the part of the other team, but like NYCFC just have dealt with more of that than any other team in the league this year. And it's masking the fact that they are actually playing the best soccer in the league this year. Really fun team to watch. Check them out. League's Cup going down. Pumas coming to uh, Yankee Stadium this week. That one is at 8 p.m. Eastern on uh, Wednesday. Two in ESPN Plus. There's two games tonight in the League's Cup. Kansas City hosting Leon. I will be there. Uh, Seattle and Tigres uh, after that at Lumen Field. Let's keep it going here. Number three in these power rankings are the Seattle Sounders. As I said, they have Tigres tonight. ESPN 2, 2 in. Uh, you can watch it there. Uh, 10 p.m. Eastern. This is a great matchup. This is a throwback matchup. I'm pretty sure I was at the game, the Jimmy Triari game, mm. in 2013. 13 in CCL and the Sounders actually advanced through that game. A little bit of a bummer here. No APG for Tigres. I think he's still dealing with a little bit of an ankle injury uh, or a knee injury. I can't remember which one it is, but I don't think he's going to be playing in this game. But you know, this is an opportunity because they didn't play this week in Doyle to just strictly talk League's Cup. <laughs> I am that guy. Are you excited for tonight? Is this a matchup that gets you going? It, it is a matchup that gets me going, and in part because I, I think there's a chance that we're going to see Nico Ladero, right? Like, like it, it seems, it, it seems like I mean, he was, he was in the lineup, or he was in the 18. I think. Yeah, he's league. played. He's he's yeah, back. Played. He's okay. played. It's been pretty quiet, honestly, okay. because we waited for it for so long, so long, so long. But he's he's back on the field for Seattle now, and now it feels like an integration process for him. Yeah, so getting him back is huge. I mean, Christian Roldan, I, I think, you know, he he didn't look quite himself this this past weekend, but that's that's fine. It's expected there to be a little lull after the Gold Cup, but I, I'm sure that, you know, it's Christian Roldan. He'll be fine. Alex Roldan is back. Rick Diaz is among the MVP candidates. This team really had to struggle through an absurd amount of injuries and absences over the first three and a half months of the year. Um, and, and they're through that. They, they are past that point now, and there are still a couple guys missing, but um, for the most part, their big names have returned, and they should be good to go, and that's what the Sounders do. The Sounders in the second half of the season, especially under Brian Schmetzer, um, have been a dominant team, and like, th there's no, no better time to flip the switch than now. Leo Chu as well, providing a little pace yeah. outside for them to go spend some money in Brazil. Went down to Grimio. I think he's 21 year old uh, winger. I think like three million dollars or so. And uh, Gar said they're in the great game now, and there's no turning back. Do you <laughs> see that second half coming for the Sounders? I do. I, I honestly do. I think they they played 
so well the first you know two and a half months of this year before uh yeah the injuries really piled up to an almost comedic extent um and even in the midst of those injuries they were still scraping together uh, a bunch of results but um you know i i think the team that played so well out of the gates that's that's who the sounders actually are they are really tough to break down defensively they have the ability to just annihilate you in transition and now with ladero back um they have the ability to to probably unlock you if you're sitting back and inviting them forward and trying to hit them in transition it's a complete team um they've you know we've we've said it before on this show on an extra time if you're trading for one person in the league it's probably not a player. You probably want to trade for Garth, Garth Lagerway. He, he has just been so good at, at putting together rosters like this. And then Schmetzer has done, I mean, I know they're not atop the power rankings or the standings anymore, but he has done a magnificent job this year of putting these players into positions to succeed and then getting more out of guys than I think most people thought was there. He's calling it a measuring stick, this uh, League's Cup game against Tigres. Reading between the lines from what he and Peter said, and I know Peter rested some players, and obviously the Sounders weren't in action this weekend, so they got some rest. I think you're going to see some mixed lineups. You're going to see veterans with younger players. You're going to see guys like that get opportunities. And that's fine for both Sporting Kansas City and Seattle, Mm -hmm. and those are the marks of great clubs in this league at this point, which is they can go down that roster to the guys they're developing, and those players can do a great job, whether it's you know uh, Christian Duke, for Kansas City or Atencio or whoever it is that's going to get into this lineup for the Sounders. That, to me, is what makes these Leagues Cup games fun. We're still at an infancy point with Leagues Cup, and I wrote today that uh, how do you treat a baby? Well, with patience and capacity for joy. That's the way we should be treating Leagues Cup. I think it will get big. I think it will get insanely competitive. I think it will get important, and it is important to these teams because there's a lot of money at stake and there's a lot of pride at stake, and it is a measuring stick to see how you measure up. If you're sporting Kansas City or Seattle and you're in this position – You're trying to prove to everybody, yourselves included, that you're among the best teams in the entire region. Forget MLS. This is your opportunity. So I'd like to see how they do it tonight. It's going to be really, really interesting uh, to see how Brian Schmetzer and Peter Vermees approach this. Sounders up a spot to three despite not playing. Sporting Kansas City are top of the Western Conference. 34 points from 18 games. One point better than the Sounders. They are number two. They went to Colorado and got a draw. Or should I say Tim Milia got a draw. That was an accurate (laughs) description for you. Uh, when we were talking Rapids at number five. I'm going to the game tonight. Mm. Sporting KC Leon. I'm bringing my brother and my son. It's going to be a great time. Got to raise these kids right. Make sure they know the biggest club competition in this hemisphere is League's Cup or will be very, very soon. Uh, I, I'm I'm opening the floor to you, Doyle. You had some questions. I wasn't able to book a guest on short notice. So uh, what are you thinking about with Kansas City? I'll try my best to answer. Well, I want to know why the defense has worked this in this game was kind of an outlier in terms of the amount of work that Timelia had to do but over the past couple of years really since they they traded Icopara after the 2018 season um this defense has been poor last year the the uh you know the underlying numbers weren't kind and then we saw in the playoffs they gave up six goals in um like 210 minutes uh they had trouble stopping anybody good this year it's not a complete 180 but they are one of the better defensive teams in the league. And so I want to ask you, what what are you seeing? Why has it worked? Well, I think you went back to something earlier in this show about like defending with possession. And I think Kansas City uh, does that really, really well. Uh, and you kind of have seen the back four in particular, Fontas and Ilya, uh, when they've been together. And Izzy Matt Marina has been great when he's been there, but it's just been inconsistent. I think really be able to get on the ball and sort of like dictate play through the midfield. And Busio has been a big part of that as well. Roger Espinosa has a resurgent year. Like when they they don't they don't I'll put it this way they don't make dumb turnovers in bad areas, which they had done a lot in the previous years and been exposed for it because the back line in isolation hadn't been able to keep up. Whether that was Fontas or Beasler or whoever it was, well, this year when you watch Sporting Kansas City and they get in one of those positions and it's much more rare than it was before, Fontas steps up. He makes mm-hmm. the tackle. He makes the play in open field. The fullbacks as well, whether it be Jalen Lindsay or Zussi, who's been resurgent this year, or Martins or Dia, they make the play. And in previous years, it just felt like when they scrambled, they collapsed. Right. And I think the percentage of collapses to scrambles are way down. Now, the big question for them going forward is how do they how do they replace Busio? Because he started every match for them this year, I believe. Well, 
the answer is that they went out inside Remy Walter before the season began and just said, hey, you're on ice, dude. You're waiting. <laughs> like, we're going to sell him. We know we're going to sell him this summer, so wait your opportunity. It will come. And now in the transfer window, they go out and immediately get a replacement in Jose Mari as well, who can play the six or the eight. So now they have the numbers to do it. My big question with Kansas City is just the health of the central defense. You know, Fontas has been consistent. Ilya has been in and out, but he's not hurt. It's just a question of personnel. Puchic hasn't played a big part. But Izzy Matt Marine to me feels like the key, um, especially sort of in that that like transition defending moments. They need him to be healthy. He has not yet been healthy. And if he's not healthy, Fontas has to continue to be like best in show, best in league, on the ball and off the ball defender. That's one of the things that you have pointed out a number of times this year that I, I'm not sure that people around the league ha have actually noticed that much is that Fontas is playing at a defender of the year. About a thousand percent. Yeah. And it's I mean, not just, it's not just his distribution, which was of course his calling card uh, coming into the league. He, he is he, the big, he is the biggest volume passer in the league. Yeah. And so they, they lean on him for that, but it's also, he's what, 30, 31 years old and he's coming off a torn Achilles and Two years ago, before he tore the Achilles, it looked like he struggled with the physicality of the league. Oh, yeah. And it's just not ha – like, that hasn't been I'm as, for him I'm as surprised as anybody else because I thought that Fontas was in the I, – I really thought he was going to be in the category of, you know, you went out and took a swing. You signed him on TAM. He had kind of fallen out with his teams in Spain, but you knew he had the attributes you wanted, and then it just didn't work. And then I, I in my mind, I was like, well – the prime ages are sort of gone. He did yeah. the he had the major injury. This just isn't going to happen for him in Kansas City, and it's happened. Yeah, which is incredible. And you got to give first of all, you got to give Fontas all the credit in the world, and you have to give Peter Vermees credit for sticking with him. Um, I think this team has another big jump to make if they can stay consistent in in those back. I'll say back three, you mm -hmm. know, the six, whoever it is, whether it's Ilya, Walter, or you know, Mari, or whatever. And then the, the two center backs. Because you know what you got in Amelia. You know you have in the front three. It's only going to get better when Johnny Russell gets into form. Alan Polito's around for a little while. Please, please, please. I still pray to you, Tata. Don't bring him in for Mexico all the time because it just robs us of, of enjoying him. And then Daniel Shallowy's best 11 MVP candidate. I think this team still has another level to reach. It's a big TBD in my mind whether they get there because they've had to get so much out of the two center backs and the six. But – we shall see tonight. Leon in town, League's Cup, Kansas City with an opportunity. They rested some players this weekend, including Johnny Russell and Alan Polito, who came off the bench in Colorado. Let's finish with number one. It's the New England Revolution. Uh, let's see if Seth is here. Yep, Seth, I just invited you to speak. Seth McComer has been on top of uh, the news around New England. That has been Carlos Heel's injury. Bruce Arena did not take uh, particularly kindly to people asking for more information about the MVP candidate in the league, but Philly still got, or excuse me, New England still got a big win this weekend at home against uh, the Union. Seth, what's up with, with Carly Seal, man? What do you know? What's new? Yeah, I mean, I could tell you from the beginning uh, that I got a source who told me that Carly Seal would be out uh, for roughly three weeks or so uh, with a sports hernia. Um, from there, we tried to get him for more information. The next day, he talked to 98.5, the sports hub, and says, well, you know, we're, we're hopeful that he'll play tonight. Um, and if he's going to be out, it's going to be short term. Uh, six hours later, he's not in the game day uh, 20. Uh, so pretty clear that there's some sort of injury going on. Uh, afterwards, uh, my colleague Sam Minton tried to get a little bit of information out of Bruce Arena. Uh, Bruce Arena not really giving away much in that, in that moment, saying, I have no updates. I'll tell you later in the week. Two days later, I'm able to jump on the press conference, and I ask him, um, what's the update? Bruce Arena again says, I have none, except that he's moving away just fine. Uh, later on in the press conference, I asked, when you say he's moving around in practice, is he moving around with the full squad or is he off to the side? Uh, Bruce Arena then reveals that he was off to the side. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not in the game day 20, uh, although they had two goalkeepers on the 20-man roster. Asked again and not really getting much information. Uh, so definitely something that, that's shrouded in mystery. Uh, Bruce Arena again saying, hey, we have a game tonight that didn't involve Carlos Hill. Ask more about that. But obviously, the Carlos Hill injury is looming large in New England. Yeah, it's bigger, it's bigger than any one result, for sure. Um, so your your sources indicate, and it, it seems pretty uh, pretty clear that this is a this is a sports hernia type of injury. Um, we don't obviously we can't confirm that because the Revs are not putting out anything official. But Carlos Hill has a is, has, has a history with that type of injury, does he not? 
Yeah, correct. In 2017, I was looking up his history just to get an idea. Uh, in 2017, when he was in loan uh, in Spain, he had a, a groin injury. Um, they tried to avoid any type of surgery. Uh, it didn't work out that way. He was ultimately had to, to have a surgery. It was out a few months. Uh, I did ask Bruce Arena about that. Uh, Bruce Arena says that he has no, no uh, information regarding those past injuries. Uh, again, kind of holding the line that um, he is rehabilitating and that they're going to move him along appropriately. Um, so they're going to take a watch and see approach to, to Carlos Hill. And his injury, his injury last year enough is not similar to this at all. Correct. That's completely unrelated. Um, that, that was something to do with his, um, his heel, I believe, um, or his, his foot at the very least. And that did require surgery, um, but he came back much sooner than expected. And we saw last year how important it is to this team because the team did much better. Uh, everyone looked much better, Bo, Buxa, the entire squad, as they headed into the playoffs last year. So obviously a really central piece. The Revs getting two, uh, getting a draw and then getting a win uh, without Carlos Hill. But you got to imagine, you know, a guy who's, who's leading so many statistics – uh, within this league, you're going to want him back on the field um, in order to make that playoff push. He so is there, he, there he was the best player in the, in the league like yeah. right now. There's just no other way to say it. There was also a, a game this weekend. You want to talk about that at all or, or no? <laughs> I mean, if you guys want to, we could talk about the game. Uh, certainly. <laughs> How about How this? You, yeah, wait, let, me, I, let me take this one. How about this? Yeah. Without heel, Buxa and Bo look more complimentary. What, did you, what do you see from this team sans Carlos Heel right now? I would actually say that I think the team, um, I think Buxa and Bo look better when when Heel is on the field because Heel uh, draws so much attention. Um, at the beginning of the year, we saw them try to get all the DPs on the field, playing a four four two formation, and uh, Carlos Heel was on the right, and it just didn't really flow that well. Um, it, it it just wasn't, you know, Heel wasn't getting enough touches on the right hand side. The, the strikers weren't really finding that that chemistry up top. So we saw them switch to a 4-2-3-1. Again, I kind of apologize to Bruce Arena. He doesn't like to talk about formations, uh, but I'm, I'm willing to talk about formations. Um, but they, they switched the formation a little bit and that led to them only playing Bo or Buxa and it kind of went back and forth. What we see afterwards is that uh, when the Gold Cup happens, they switch to a 4-4-2 diamond. If things really start to work, the chemistry starts to happen Carlos Heels in the middle, uh, but you're also able to get those two forwards up top. And I think that you see Heel draw so much attention. And then Buxa, as a guy who can um, win aerial duels and hold up the ball really well, he draws attention. And that allows Bo to be a floater. Like, he's allowed to then go find those spaces and hit those bangers and do all the things that, that Bo wants to do. I think this past weekend you saw that um, – Bo had, to, especially in the first half, Bo had to drop really deep into the midfield to try to receive the ball. And he did okay with that. But if you're the Revs, you want Bo closer to the goal. You want him, like, just kind of, you know, um, on the prowl like a Panther, uh, trying to find those opportunities. And I think you also <laughs> saw in the first half that Buxo didn't really get on the ball at all because they weren't going long. He wasn't holding up the ball. He wasn't having those aerial duels. So without Carlos Hill on the field, it, it, the team looks different. And, and I think it's a compliment to, to Bruce Arena that they're still able to get results, that you lose a guy who has 15 assists, that has 75 key passes, that ha that's, that's, you know, averaging five key passes a game, and you're still able to get a result. Granted, it gets a very young Philly team, but the Philly team did look very good. And I think, Doyle, you would agree that part of the reason you're able to do that is because of the play of Matt Turner. Oh, yeah, I mean, he, he was the difference in this game. There, there were, what, two – basically two breakaways that he stopped. And like, that's, I mean, that's the nice thing about having the best goalkeeper in the league is sometimes you get the uh, results that you otherwise wouldn't have gotten. Um, but for this game, it did, it was still the four, four, two diamond, unless I'm mistaken for, from the revs. Um, and it looks like even without heel, they, they will go forward with that formation that Bruce has gone back to over the past month or so. Right. I think for now, I think that it was a little bit flatter, in my opinion, versus um, against Nashville. Uh, against Nashville, I think they just you, – you lose Carlos Hill, and you say, we got this guy who was amazing in the Gold Cup, um, young player of the tournament, uh, Tejon Buchanan. Let's throw him in the middle and, and see how it works. Just do kind of – it's not a like for like. I definitely agree it's not a like for like. But you just say everything else is kind of working. You get those Gold Cup guys back in. You get Captoon in. Um, 
and then you put, you know, Tejon Buchanan at the top of the diamond. My issue with that, and I think you see it in that game, is that Tejon Buchanan is best in space. Mm-hmm. You want him going at players. You want him taking people on. In order for that to happen, he needs to be, in my opinion, a little bit wider, or you need him to be uh, higher. So I, I say that it's a little bit flatter because Buchanan was, was on the right-hand side and he was able to drift out a little bit wider. Um, and, and he draws five fouls against Philadelphia, including one of the PKs um, that, that ends up being the game winner. Um, and if you look at the Philly game, he only draws one foul. And Tejon Buchanan is a guy who's drawing 2.6 uh, fouls per game. So it, it's an interesting metric to use how successful a player is. But I think the Revs and, and Tejon Buchanan, you want to get him in spaces where he's either you know getting assists or scoring goals or at the very least drawing fouls. Again, another problem when you lose Carlos Heel is that those fouls are less deadly when Carlos Heel is on the field. I mean, the Revs had nine corners against um, the Union, and they didn't look great. I mean, uh, you have Bo trying those, but you kind of want Bo to be in the mix somewhere. You know, if he's not necessarily trying to win headers, then he's outside trying to, to get the second ball and hit a shot. Um, and that also affects the guy. You got, so you had him, you had, uh, I believe, McNamara, Tristison, lots of different options trying to take set pieces. And they just didn't look not good. And they were even going to a point where um, they were trying short corners um, more frequently. So I, I think that there's there's things to figure out if this is something that the team has to deal with um, more than you know two or three weeks. Seth McComber, the Bent Musket. Seth, thank you for joining us. One last question for you. And no, it's not because Andrew Farrell's on here, but it's incredible that he has the most starts in Revs history, a club with the the players that they have and the longevity that so many of those players have. Uh, you know, you don't gotta you don't gotta wax poetic here if you don't want to, but Andrew Farrell, he's a I mean, he he's been there for a decade. It's pretty incredible. I remember him getting drafted. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we at the Bent Musket will usually do a, a pregame. Um, spaces, and we're constantly talking about Andrew Farrell, a guy who's played every minute of every game this year, uh, which I think says a lot when the the uh, schedule is so congested. Uh, when you see that, you know, he has to start with uh, Bell and Kessler. There's some rotation that's happening, but you don't move that rock. That he is someone who provides the leadership, and I think more than anything else is that when you play the Revolution right now, because they throw their their fullbacks forward so much. Um, because they put a lot of players forward, you're going to deal with some emergency defending that teams like to try to challenge the Reds by playing very direct, whether it's um, down the flank, and you saw that in the fifth minute against the Union. They try to, to hit the Reds against the, the, the play by going down the flank, I believe it was Santos, or other games where they kind of play a long ball down the middle. Um, and there's a really great chemistry between uh, Farrell and, and uh, Turner, where Farrell's not necessarily able to make the tackle, and oftentimes he does make the tackle, he's able to shepherd the ball into a spot. So I, I think that um, Andrew Farrell is someone that we're going to talk about as a player with longevity that's, that's offered a lot for this club, that's played many different roles for this club. Um, and certainly, if he wants to follow me after this conversation, he can follow me on Twitter. <laughs> but no, he, he, I, I, he, he's, he's absolutely a great guy. That's the thing I will say about Andrew Farrell is, uh, he's often tasked with having to talk to the media after losses. And that's a real. Under uh, Heaps and Friedel, uh, he was someone that will stand up and say, hey, we didn't do good enough. I didn't do good enough. And that's that's a spot that not a lot of players want to be in. So for a guy who's had this great of career, for a guy who, who um, continues to be a veteran presence and be a really good guy, those are all really positive things. And, and I think that he's not talked about enough, how, all the good things that he does uh, for the club. Oh, look at that. A virtual pat on the back. Andrew, uh, I'm a big fan of Andrews everywhere. So uh, congrats <laughs> to you on 10 years, 255 starts. Big win for the Revs this weekend. They are one. Seth, thanks for joining us, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's... Let's call this thing good. Here's your top 10 if you're watching on YouTube. New England 1, Kansas City, Seattle 2-3. and three. It's been that way for a while. New York City down a couple spots to 4. Colorado up a couple spots to 5. Galaxy, Orlando, D.C., big risers, 6 spots from 14 to 8 in these power rankings for Week 18. Philly, who got CCL this week, Thursday night at Estadio Azteca against Cuba America, and then Nashville dropping 5 spots 
to 10. Those are your power rankings, top 10 for week 18, the full rankings at MLSsoccer.com on the MLS app. Of course, we do this live show on Twitter Spaces every week at 11 a.m. Eastern on my uh, my Twitter handle, so check it out. And if you miss it or you have to jump in and out, of course, the top 10 is on YouTube. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for watching, everybody.